We find here in uh, Isaiah chapter 42, it says in verse 9, Behold, the former things are come, come to pass, and new things do I declare, not suggest, not hope you understand, but I declare, proclaim them to you. Before they spring forth, I'll tell you of them. And tonight I hope these things I'm going to tell you uh, won't be so brand new, but there'll be an encouragement and an establishment of what God's already spoken to your heart. If not, let it be brand new and let it be exciting. In Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1, it says, there's a time and purpose to everything under heaven. And there's a time and a purpose that we're moving into. And it's different than what we came out of. It's totally different than what we came out of. The word of faith move was a very precious move. God did wonderful things, but God has begun to begin to do different things. And they're going to be totally different than what we've been used to. The way we've ministered, the way we've prayed, the way we've preached shall all change and come into a new dimension of authority and boldness. One thing that the Christians are lacking today, especially in America, is the boldness to do what God called them to do and let the world try to figure them out. Amen. We're not called to make the world understand everything. They're called to try to find what makes us tick. They're called to sit there and look at us strange. That's all right. Quit watering down what God has given us. Quit watering down the anointing that God has granted us. It's time that we walk in our high calls and not in our low calls. If you're scared of persecution, get saved. This next movie is going to have a lot of persecution in it. If you think the last few years have been persecution uh, at its height, there's going to come a new dimension of your understanding of persecution. And we've got to get used to it. Anytime God begins to pour out His power and His glory and His anointing and the people begin to flow in authority with it, the devil's going to fight. And we're moving into a new season in the body of Christ. And that new season is not just being real sweet and nice and, and walking in soulish love that never does nothing for anybody. Amen. Amen. There is a biblical uh, thing I want to go to in the book of Joshua. There are several things I want to follow through tonight. But in the book of Joshua, there's a good explanation and a good illustration of what we're going through right now. In Victory Christian Center along with all the other churches, have to decide and decide strong where they're going to go. See, well, that's kind of a, a bold statement. Well, it's the truth. We had to go through that in our ministry. I thought, Lord, you know, I can go out here and be a nice little teacher and die. I can try to make everybody else happy or make you happy and, and enjoy the blessings of God. And lose a few folks that get upset. If you're living and you're going to obey God, somebody's going to get mad at you. Might as well accept that. And somebody's not going to like you. So cope with it and go on. If we're going to press on into the kingdom and do what God's called us to do, even some of our brothers in the past move are going to get upset at what we do in the new. It's going to come. It's going to come that way. And I begin to pray, Lord, how can I preach what, what you're doing now? I've got to have some illustrations from the Bible to, to bring it out correctly. Because I can preach it from my heart, but you've got to have the Scripture to go with that heart sermon. And the Lord said, go to Joshua, chapter 1. And I went over there and I began to read in Joshua, chapter 1. It says, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses minister saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over to Jordan, you and all this people, unto the land that I have given to them, even to the children of Israel. And the Lord kept saying to me, Study the anointings of Moses and Joshua. What is the difference between the two? And I begin to look at Moses' anointing. And in Deuteronomy 29, verse 5, it describes Moses' anointing. And I want to use the word maintenance. In the latter part of Moses' life, he cared of maintaining anointing. Their shoes didn't grow old. Their clothes didn't grow old. Whenever they complained, God provided. But all they did was wander in the wilderness with clothes that never wore out. They never got the promise. 
They never enjoyed the ecstasy of walking into what God called them to do. All they enjoyed was maintenance, knowing that their clothes wasn't going to wear out tomorrow morning, knowing their shoes were going to stay on their feet. And then Moses died. And then there came Joshua. And Joshua came on the scene, and he was not like Moses. He didn't wander in the wilderness. God told him, get up and move. We're going over today. The Joshua anointing is a warring anointing. Yes. It's a fighting anointing. It's a confronting anointing. Yes. It's, a, it's an attacking anointing. Yes. It's aggressive. It's blasting. It's making lots of people nervous. Sometimes very nervous. And that's what we're doing right now in the body of Christ. The word of faith move can be likened to Moses because the word of faith move taught us how to get healed and stay healed, which is perfectly wonderful and will always carry that truth with us. It taught us how to prosper and stay prosperous. But now that move has come to an end. Moses has died again. And God is bringing Joshua on the scene again. And his command and his voice to the body is not let's wander another 40 years. It's not let us go out there and believe for clothes that won't wear out, but let us take those truths and go get the promise that belongs to us. And that's what we're seeing in 1988. And every church, every ministry must make the decision. Are they going to live with Moses? Or are they going to go on with Joshua? Are you going to the promise? Or are you going to wander in the wilderness with your nice, maintaining anointing? As soon as Joshua came on the scene, he didn't have a committee meeting. He didn't discuss with all of his friends if this is the right anointing. He said, God has spoken for us to get up and move. Get your things together in three days. We're going over. Well, in three days, there could be a lot of discussion. There could be a lot of thinking about it. But there was none of that. And they began to go over and they faced Jericho. And they didn't go out and say, oh, let's have a, a nice little treaty with the king of Jericho. God didn't say talk to the king of Jericho. He said destroy Jericho. And he gave the way to do it. And it wasn't your normal warfare tactics. Walk up and hit the gate. He said, Joshua, get out there and walk that city. Walk it. And I'm sure some people's heads might go, walk it. Yes, walk it. Then the last time around, after so many days, then everybody screams. In other words, gets loud. The Joshua anointing has loudness in it. It's all right to be loud. Say, well, loudness is not power. Quit using that as an excuse to stay in your weak realm. Ah. Hallelujah. And I was just having that in my heart, just praying and meditating on it. And the Lord began to take me to Joshua and these things, and then he said this to me. And let me present this to you here. Not an accusation, but just present it to you. Because I'm under command tonight, and I cannot not say what I feel the Lord saying to me to say to you tonight. He said, God... He said, I did not give men the anointing to have a big church, to build a big building, just to be big and well-known. He said, I gave them that anointing as a foundational plan for the end times. He said, I gave them that anointing to pull the people together, to have a voice in the communities, to let my name go forth and my word of that hour be heard throughout even the sinner's camp. And he said, one reason why there's trouble in the camps of some of these men and women with these wonderful churches is because they've grown too comfortable in the realm of their anointing. And God wants to take them out of that, that basic uh, foundation that has built these wonderful churches and take them into another realm of launching and disturbing the powers of the devil and bringing back the Lord Jesus Christ the way he wants to see the church in the last days. That's what we're coming to. And it's not so much that we have to do a lot of natural rearranging. It's the spiritual rearranging. You see, the anointing provides for itself. It provides the people. It provides the money. It provides the building. It provides if you walk in the height of it. 
Now, if you walk in the low call, you won't make it. It's the low call where everybody likes you. That's where no one persecutes you. Everybody thinks you're wonderful, and, and you never do really much. It's in the high call. It's where you disturb the devils and the flesh and those who don't want to go on. That's where the most fun's at, too. That's where it's at. And we're coming into the Joshua day. We're going to see Joshua's come, and the Moseses are going to die. Either they, they can die two ways. Die by seeing what God is doing and come into the fresh move of God with boldness and authority and excitement, ready to run with what God's doing, or they'll die a natural way and they'll just drizzle up and be no more. That's the decision many have to make. God did not give us an anointing just to be nice. He gave us an anointing to carry out the works of God. We are in a warfare. We're not out there on a Caribbean cruise floating on the beach. We're going to a spiritual Vietnam, and this time we're going to win. We're going to win this thing. But you know, if you go to a war trying to be nice and just maintain your little world, you're the first to be shot and out. You're the first to leave. You've got to be a, a, a warrior. And this is the season when war has come again to the camp of God's people. We're not going out for a nice little lullaby. This next move is the Joshua style of anointing. It is fighting, confronting, uh, walking into, and blasting what's not right. Blasting it. Not just discussing it or writing another book about it, but removing it from the true sense of the Spirit where it has no more life. God didn't tell Joshua, let a few of the Jericho people live. He said, destroy the whole camp. This is the day when there shall come destruction to the camp of the evil, and the righteous are the ones who are going to bring it. There are three things the devil has done so skillfully to remove the authority and the power and the zeal from the church and his people. He removed, number one, the message of deliverance. Now, saying that word some places is like cussing. Are you here? Even way up there, wake up. Are you here? Using the word deliverance sends chills to so many people. They go, well, you know all these people that were in deliverance, they go too far. <laughs> but what about the truth of that message? Why do we let the flakes and the weirdos dictate our obedience to God? Why doesn't God dictate it to us? We've got too many other voices around us telling us what to do, not what to do. And what the devil has done, he's removed all of our strength to fight and attack and plow and go to the higher realms of God. He's even got us believing and using this the wrong way. The deep things are the simple things. And we use that more of an excuse of not to go to the deeper realms of God. To stay in the shallow places because you knew the deep things are the simple things. Very true. But there are depths to those simple things that we must get into. We must get into them. We use those kind of things to keep us in our nice little worlds while the world out there is going to hell and God's beginning to be grow sad because of our disobedience to our high call. There are many of you in this room tonight that are called to preach the gospel. You're called to work for the Lord Jesus Christ. But many things are holding you back and you're sitting there frustrated. Why doesn't things work for me? Why aren't things going? Why is my family disturbed? Why is my son, uh, this morning he wakes up and tells me he's gay. Why is this happening? You may not tell anybody around you, but those kind of things are happening to many people. And they're sitting there, they're wondering why. I prayed, I confessed, I got prayed for, but it didn't seem to work. You don't know why? Because you didn't plow, you didn't fight, you didn't war, you didn't enjoy it when you did do it. And he's got, the devil's got uh, skillfully removed the message of deliverance from the church. From a lot of our word of faith churches. Then he removed very skillfully intercession with travails and groans from the church. To where all we do now is pray in our shimmy tongue. Shimmy, shimmy, shoot. 
and we call that deep prayer. That's why your family's in turmoil. That's why your ministry's not moving. That's why there's not a fresh anointing upon your life that you so want. There's a way you get it. There's a way it comes unto you, and there's a way it stays upon you. He removed that message so skillfully. Everybody was excited a few years ago about praying, and things begin to happen. There was excitement. The glory of God began to increase because you cannot intercede and not have the glory increase in your life in church. So, well, we don't want to go too far. We became more aware of the ditches than we did the highway that we were supposed to travel on. We preached more ditch sermons, more scared of all the extremes and our reputations than praying down the right thing to bless the world that needs our help. And God is bringing back to us a season by which these things which have been skillfully removed can be brought back in an accurate way for the body of Christ to function in. It'll come. And many churches right now, it's on their doorstep. And God's asking them again, will you allow my Holy Spirit to come into your house and begin to pray again through your people and through yourself? to bind the bondages and to break through and to pray down the glory that belongs unto us. He's not coming for a spotted church. He's coming for one that's full of his glory, full of his power, and full of his strength. But it's not going to come by just confessing and living in the maintenance mentality that we are so strong in right now. We've got to remove it and find joy in going forward and attacking and he's right now very skillfully trying to remove the rejoicing of the righteous. He stopped us attacking uh, oppressions and, and possessions of people's lives to get them free. He stopped us from praying the way we should pray. He took away our boldness, our authority, made us think that we were strange when we prayed in bold tongues and blasted the enemy. Made us think that we are strange when we go, Hi, cool, she come under my high. He can put all she can under the day. Ooh, that's, ooh. <laughs> don't go too far. So don't go far at all. Just stay there and do nothing. That's what the devil wants. If he can't own you, he'll box you. Put you in a little box. And that's a great deception. Thinking you're free when you're in a box. I refuse to live in a box. I like my liberty in God. I like the joy I get every morning when I get up and go, no, you don't. I shook my tie. We get up, I get up every morning, especially when I'm in, the, in my hometown, the Twin Cities. And there's a lot of wild devils there. I like them. I'm not scared of them. I like fighting the devil. You should too. So, well, you know, we don't want to fight the devil. Then you're a chicken. So we just want to love the Lord. A part of loving God is fighting the enemy like Jesus did in his lifetime. He didn't go through those towns and saying, well, all right, you can do this if you want to. He went up there and he blasted them. He told them what was what and laid it on them. That's what we're coming into too. We're coming out of the teach back into the preach, glory to God. Ha! We're coming back into the preaching anointing. We've almost lost the art of preaching by the Holy Spirit's inspiration. We've been so used to the teaching that if anybody shows up flowing a little bit different, it scares our life. Like, whoa, what are we going to do with that one? Because we didn't have a three-point message that laid it out in front of you real nice and simple and say, walk in this formula. Preachers don't have formulas. Preachers are this. They proclaim, declare, demand, and they uh, confront. And that's different. And when you think of a preacher, too, you usually think of an evangelist preaching. But there is coming apostolic and prophetic preaching to the body of Christ that we have not yet seen. It's coming. And it's not going to come to all the ones that we look to in the last move. God is going to bring a new voice. A new breed shall come into the earth. It'll come bold. And some of you are part of that new breed, part of that new leadership of God. Are you having fun yet? Hallelujah, I am. Hallelujah. 
rabasika manamahai. We're coming out of that teaching realm. There'll always be teachers, for sure. But we're coming to where we're going to hear a whole lot more of the preachers. And they don't just, you know, have their nice little message. They preach by inspiration. They have a stirring down inside of them. They have maybe have one word that God is saying, and that's all that they know. They may have just one verse, but they've been in their prayer closet. They've been in the Word. And when they come out, they come out like a man from another world. That's what we need is men that will preach from another world, not these nice little dead sermons of how to do this and how to do that. God wants preachers to come again. Ah. He wants it in victory. He doesn't want all of you to go out of here as teachers. There are many of you who are called preachers. You're apostles and prophets, and you need to operate in that thing and quit letting, waiting for somebody to approve of you. Ah. Oh, they're coming. They're coming. Glory to God. Hallelujah. They're coming. I've waited for this day. When I started preaching, I thought, Lord, this is not me in this move. I'm not called to teach. I tried and it was sick. It didn't work. It was too dry. But when I got over into preaching, that's where I found the anointing that breaks every yoke. And that's what many of you are trying to, you're trying to teach, and God wants you to preach. He wants you to preach. He wants to see again the healing of dangerous come on the scene. He wants to see the prophetic voice go out there and confront that which is wrong and come back with a victory, not bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road. He wants you to win. You don't have to die. I refuse to die. Gotta get that inside of you. This is not youthful zeal. I felt that coming from some. <laughs> this is the new move, glory to God. The preachers are coming. See, Moses gave out the law of what to do here, there, and all these things. But Joshua came and he took the promise. He went in and divided the inheritance and gave it to the people. And that's what we need today, that we can plow into the realm of God, into the realm of the Spirit, and take ground and enjoy the victory and the excitement of possessing what belongs unto us. It's come unto us in this day. And the devil's been trying so skillfully to remove your excitement, your rejoicing, from letting the redeemed say so, that the redeemed be quiet is what is he, what's, what's he saying. Just sit there and be redeemed and don't declare it. Let the righteous be glad but don't express it. Sit there and be dead. Don't shout, don't move, don't dance, don't holler, don't scream. But you'll find under the Joshua anointing all of that there. It's there. So, well, you know, I, that makes me nervous. Well, get delivered from religious devils. Ha! Hallelujah. <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 11. I'm going to have a good meeting tonight. God loves you. But he won't always flow the way you think you should flow. You have to go his direction to get his blessing. So, well, I want to go this way. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. We find here in the second chapter, uh, the second book of Samuel, the chapter 11, reading the first three verses. It came to pass after the year was expired, at the times when the kings go forth to battle, that David, he stayed at Jerusalem. And it came to pass at evening time that David rose off of his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and she was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And many times when I preach from this chapter, I've always preached it from the sexual drive of the human being. 
And when I was coming back from Sweden, the Lord said, go back and read this. And I went back and I kept reading this and he said, just read the first three verses and, uh, and they're really interesting. But I didn't know that when I first started reading them. I kept reading, I said, oh, Lord, I must be blind because I'm not getting nothing out of this. I mean, David's, you know, he's home and he sees a woman and we all know what happened. And then God says, what time was it? And I first off, off the top of my head, I go, well, the year expired. He goes, no, wrong time. That's carnal time. What time was it, Robert? So I kept reading. And I finally saw that second part of the first verse. It was the time when the kings go forth to battle. Not the time when they stayed home where it was comfortable and nice and rosy and there was no conflict and no battle. And the Lord said, David, one reason why he did what he did, he had a child, he was an adulterer and became a murderer. And it was not just because his sexual drive was not kept under control, but it was because he missed the season by which God was moving in. It was the season when the kings go forth to battle. And David did not go. Where was David at? David was in his home, walking around, being lazy, having it nice and easy. Didn't want to intercede and travail. Didn't want to cast out devils on a Sunday morning. Didn't want to have a prayer line and knock the devils off the people so they can be free this week. They wanted to be nice and easy. Don't want to preach an authoritative message because it make me, uh, make Mr. Big Bucks nervous. Or it may make a, a reputation, a, a little trickle go out through all the, all of the, all the world. He just stayed home where it was nice, where it was easy, where there's always beautiful things you shouldn't be involved with where they're at. David committed adultery and became a murderer because he didn't move with the season of God. And what we are seeing today and will see greater, if the men and the women of leadership today do not go forth to battle and fight, they will end up just like David did, sleeping with the woman of their failure. And they'll give birth to heartache like David did. But David, this should have never been in the life of David. Never should have been there. Today there are X-rated movies on this episode in David's life. How would you like to be remembered like that? He missed it because he wanted to stay with his flesh and his soul. All the other kings went, and the righteous king stayed home because he thought it, he had it together. He didn't want to bow down in front of his church and intercede and teach the people how to break the powers of the devil. He didn't want to get out there where the mud is, or in other words, where the devils are, on the front lines of battle, where it's tough, where there's spiritual sweat. Let's stay where it's nice and easy. And if men and women stay where it's nice and easy, if they stay in the king's palace, they'll not see the dawning of God's glory on their life as God wishes it to be. They'll not see it. The churches will collapse. They'll fall. They'll shrink. There'll be no more. Their voice, which used to be so authoritative throughout the world, will become hardly uh, uh, able to hear in their own city. And I've already seen that happen. It takes something to keep the authority that God's given you. It takes everything. Right now we're waging great war in the Twin Cities. It's wonderful. There's three things about warfare you need to know. Let me give them to you real fast. It has to be scriptural. 
has to be a way of life. And the last one's the best. It has to be fun. You can't punch devils out and be, oh, I'm so tired. That's a devil on you. You see, what we're getting into is God is sending training sergeants into the church. And when you go into the military, they don't ask you if you want to give up 5 o'clock in the morning and run three miles. <laughs> they don't ask you if you want to do these things. They tell you, get up and move it. And that's what needs to be in the church to build troopers that can go through it and endure a hardness as a good soldier. To so get up and pray in tongues loud and don't give me that old stupid stuff you've been praying for the last three months. You'd love to work for me. All my employees, they have to get up and they have to pray every morning with me in that office. And they cannot pray in these quiet little shimmy shimmy tongues because if you do, you won't live through my ministry. We go through too many wars and such dramatic battles that ooka booka boo, well, you'll be the first one dead. <laughs> If you pray loud enough for your ears to hear your voice with authority in that war tongue for a few hours every day, for a while, and then make it all the time. <laughs> Just fly in the airplanes. Don't get it. That irritates me. Because that's not going to help you in what we're moving into in the body of Christ. There's time for quiet communion. But it's not 95% of your prayer life. There's time to confess the word, but that's not 50% of your prayer life. There's deeper dimensions we got to go into, and there's deeper dimensions men have to preach. To whom much has been given, there's much required. Get up and start praying in tongues and let the Holy Ghost pray through you. And let See, most folks are still saying, see Jane run in the Spirit. <laughs> Look at Spot jump after the ball. And then we wonder why God can't use us in a greater way because we won't even allow him to move through our, our prayer life to a greater way of, uh, of prayer. I'm not condemning you tonight, but I am pointing very directly. And if you feel convicted, hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. See, most folks don't know the difference between conviction or condemnation. As soon as they feel like they're not the greatest thing that hit earth, they feel like, well, you're condemning me. I'm being condemned. That conviction is a part of the way we're trained to be good troopers for God. Amen. Saying, well, it's not right. Yes, I see it. And begin to develop and let God bring it in the right balance in your life. Because if you balance it, it'll probably be real small you'll pray like that. Right now, the war side of God is coming forth. Yeah. Exodus 15. We have the greatest time. I refuse to have a bad day. I refuse it. I refuse for my employees to have a bad day, too. It's not allowed. There has to be joy for the anointing to be on every letter, every package, every response. There has to be joy there. And when you're in war, it has to be fun fighting the devil. I like it. Even if he doesn't punch me first, I'm punching him first. I get up some mornings and he's not around, so I honey. So I know you're out there doing something. And I bomb you in Jesus' name. I break your power. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, 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 Pray in tongues right in his face. So you got to get into it. You can't play this nice ooka booga. Oh. Are you getting this? It's got to get inside of you. You got to get in there. I live like this and it's the greatest thing. I wouldn't live any other way. Say, well, this is, you're just going through, uh, you know, you're, you're just in wars. I live in them. Because I don't camp out in the wilderness. 
I'm facing Jericho, the Amalekites, the Jebusites, all the other ites. I'm looking for them. I want my promised land. I want everything that belongs to me. And whatever ites there, when I get there, he's moving. Yeah. So you got to have that inside of you. There's that ha in there that you got to get. That war, huh, that's there. That's a part of God's character that many of us today don't understand. We understand his love, his faithfulness, all these wonderful things we've been taught. But what about here in Exodus 15, 3? Moses is singing a victorious song before he became a maintenance man. He says, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. The Lord is a warrior. He doesn't mind a good fight. You know, the first great battle of all battles was not on earth. You find in Revelations 12, verse 7 there, it says, There was a war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his, and they prevailed not, and they were all cast out. The first great war of all wars was between God and and Lucifer in heaven. That's where it was. That's where the first great battle was. The day the devil decided to be number one in heaven. And the way some people believe today, and the way they try to make love out, they give new definitions to love to cover their, uh, their desire of not wanting to deal with things. Just walk in love. Just walk in love. And I believe in the love walk with all of my heart. But there's a lot of folks using that phrase as a defense of not dealing with the issues of their life and ministry and in the world. Now, what if we had like this in heaven, the way some people believe the love walk should be? Well, all right, you want to be up here, Lucifer. You have the throne Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I'll have it the rest of the time. Because I want to walk in love and, and be nice and I don't want to disturb uh, all of your people. That's the way some people are. Let's walk in love and let's let uh, people do what they want to do and not tell them what's what. The love of God is twofold. It has acceptance and confrontation in it. Jesus accepts everybody. In the love walk, we accept everybody. But the other side of love, because we love people so much and God loves us so much, we confront and deal with the issues to make them a better person or a better organization or a better whatever. But see, a lot of folks, they don't have that because they're so weak in their inward man. They're so insecure that when they have to say something, you know, well, I don't know what to do. I don't like that. God doesn't want you like that. He wants you to be strong and bold and aggressive, accurate, efficient. But when you do it, you never back down. Even if they lie on you, the truth outlives a lie. See, that's what we're going to have. We're going to have the confrontations of God in this move. Joshua confronted Jericho. He confronted the other men. We're going to have confrontation. One reason maybe why your home is not the way it should be is because you haven't confronted what's trying to get in your home. Confrontation is wonderful when it's done by the Spirit. And God, when that war in heaven occurred, he didn't compromise with the enemy. He'd have probably been accused of being mean by some today because he kicked the devil out with all of his angels. Sure is quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> he didn't do that. He kicked him out with all of the angels that agreed with Lucifer. He said, out. Out. He dealt with it. He made a decision. And he executed it. Boom. There are issues that the church is facing that many people are scared to, to minister on. And they must be for the sake of the body of Christ. They must be dealt with uh, directly. And not everything 
that God wants us to do is going to make those people happy. They're going to be offended. There's this thing that we don't want to offend anybody, and I don't want to offend anybody, but there comes a place where you must decide, am I going to obey what the truth is and what God is saying, or I'm going to allow the people's emotions and opinions to dictate to me? I made that decision. I made it. I said, I will not. I love everybody. I'm willing for them to succeed, but there is a line in my life that I will not cross. I will not cross it. And everybody has to have that. As a person, as a family, as a church, as a ministry. If God is for you, then you will make it if you do what's right. And the ministries that are going through turmoil today, one of the reasons why is because they don't fight and they have not gone forth to battle when it's the season, and this is the season. And the devil is taking them for lunch and dinner and early breakfast. See, the ministers today are not falling apart on the outside. They're deteriorating on the inside. And that means there's not the right kind of praying going on. It can look real good. See, there's two sources of strength for your human life and for the ministry. I've always asked the question, why could Samson be so anointed but die at the feet of Delilah? Why could this man have such a wonderful anointing to pick up the city gates and carry them off but die at Delilah's feet? Why could he slay the Philistines all by himself, a one-man army? But Delilah died at Delilah's feet. That's always bugged me. I was in a city out east, and we were looking for the church, and we got lost and got in the bad part of town. And I now believe if it was God that kind of got us lost, you know, because of what happened. We drove up to this stop sign, and I looked up, and there was a theater sign. And it was a pornographic theater. And I looked up at it, and it said, Samson and Delilah. And when I saw that, and I, that, that forever haunts me. There's positive hauntings in life. Positive hauntings. I looked at that, and, the, and I kept hearing the Spirit of God say, how would you like to be remembered like that? How would you like to be remembered like that? His fall happened many years ago. But still in 1988, the devil that got him is still flaunting that victory today. And I begin to search, and I study these great men. I look at Brother Branham. How could a man die thinking he was Elijah when he was so highly anointed? Why does these great things happen to these men, these men in their ministries? Because there's two sources of strength and they only operate in one. You see, you can have a wonderful anointing here. But when you get behind that curtain and go back to your hotel room, what do you live off of? The anointing does not give you everyday strength. It gives you the strength to minister to the needs of the people that you're with. Because they were weak in their human spirit. The human spirit is what gives you the everyday triumphs. The anointing is what gives you the ministerial triumphs out here with you in your life. Samson failed because he didn't have a personal relationship with God that was right. He was anointed, but he didn't know God for his private life. And there are many ministries today and, and churches today that everything looks wonderful but behind the scenes they're crumbling because they're not building the right thing there they're not praying the right way because they're still praying in those quiet little shimmy shimmy tongues 
They're not developing that, that strength in there, building that inward man to be a soldier. And when the devil faces them with a Delilah, no matter what it may be, they have no power to resist, no power to deal with. They're weak, they're insecure because they didn't build their inward man. They couldn't say no and keep their nose strong. It turned into a soulless yes, and they died. And there are churches and ministries today that are facing the same thing. Here and flow with. Say, well, you know, there's always folks that go too far. Welcome to life. There's always somebody, for whatever reason, immaturity, hurts and wounds, they go, go too far. But don't let those people stop you from doing what it takes to enjoy Jesus and his will for your life. I refuse. I'm going to enjoy God. I'm going to obey God. And I'm going to be here until the time for me to go home. Say, well, that's pride. No, that's because I know that I know how I've decided to live my life. I believe that your inward man should be stronger than your anointing. That way, there's no... I know a, a minister right now that the anointing has become his enemy because he gets up and he preaches. But when he goes behind the scenes and that anointing lifts, he goes through such great depression and turmoil. And his wife came to me and said, I married a man that for many years he was the same man in the pulpit and in the home. But now he's a different person and I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help him. I'll tell you how to help him. You need to get him in his prayer closet and get him out of his nice little shimmy shimmy tongues. He's probably not even doing that. And build that inward man to where it's the same strength or greater so there's no deficiency, there's no drop. Because the anointing, if I can use this positively, is like a drug. It gives you a, a high. You get under that anointing, there's some uh, times under the anointing, you're preaching and you're like you're five feet off the ground. You're in another world. And when that lifts, People go through these turmoils. And it's because they didn't build their inward man. My goal in life, and I'll even go so far to say your goal in life should be too, is that your inward man is the same strength or stronger. So when you come out from the anointing, all you do is change sources, but there's no difference in the way you function. So when you're, how come I'm a high tier? Back behind the scenes, you're doing the same thing. But it comes from a different vein. And the same for the church. See, there's joy in obeying God and being on the cutting edge. There's joy in found in pushing back the demons in darkness. But the reason why people go through turmoil and stress and strain and they get scared is because they don't build that inward man. They don't put the word and they don't build that inward man with that strong tongue. Rombos he come a high. Lembreve he come a dolive. Rambrosho come a dada high. You pray like that for 30 or for 30 minutes to an hour, you'll come out of your bedroom another person. Nothing will bug you. You won't be scared of anybody. You'll love everybody and you're ready to get them. That's the way we're supposed to live. We're aliens, so let's live like it. You know what the Bible says? We're aliens. What is an alien? Somebody who talks different, who thinks different, who has power that the normal earth person who does not have. That is the born-again, spirit-filled Christian. We talk a different language. We believe a different way. We have power that comes from on high. And there's joy that can be found in life in the ministry. There's joy in obeying God. You don't have to go through hell. You don't have to go through turmoil. You can have fun triumphing every day in Christ over the enemy. That's the life we're supposed to live. Just not maintaining. Well, today I didn't have anything uh, to fight. And we make that a great day. The great day is when we have something to fight and we win. That's a great day. 
The Lord is a warrior. He's not a Geneva Summit man. He's not a committee man. He doesn't sit down and try to find out a compromising situation that both sides will be happy with. There is a right and there is a wrong. There is no neutrality in the realm of the spirit. There is light and there is darkness. There is no gray. There is right and there is wrong. There is no well, whatever. That's what makes people nervous because we're coming into that day when we must live that way. When everything that we do and say, we've got to live on the right side because the wrong shall be brought down and shall be exposed for what it is. God wants us to be weapons of war. In Jeremiah 51 and verse 20, it says that we are his battle axe and we are his weapons of war. That with, uh, with us, he wants to break, into the, break the nations into pieces, to break the horse and the rider. The nations of God are represented here at Victory. You're not called just to have a nice realm, have a nice service. You're called to have strength and power to launch the gifts of God into the world to do the work of God. It's time that we move out of spiritual slavery into spiritual launching. God has got to the place where he's upset with a few men because they're scared to lose. They're scared to release a gift. They develop them just enough to keep them beneficial to, the, to their own life and ministry. And God doesn't like that spiritual slavery. There will always be those who are called to assist every work. But then there are those called to come and be trained and to be launched. And this is the day when the young and the old shall flow together as one. For the saints to move to higher ground, it's not time look to the past or to your former ways but to look to be Jesus Lord. 